Okay. Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and hopefully I'm live, and hopefully uh, um, we could see it. you could see me. I'm in my kitchen at home. I'm home today, and I got a sport jacket on. I, I don't dress that way at home usually. Usually I'm in pajamas, but um, since I'm not going to be wearing a sport jacket, I had about 20 lectures canceled, like all of us did the next few months. I figured I might as well dress up since I'm in the kitchen, and. Um, um, everything is good. Now, we um, tried something new. This is the first Facebook Live in forever. We're using, uh, we're going to use PowerPoint. And this is going to be on a COVID-19 update. I was going to do something else today talking about the changes COVID will bring, but we'll save that for another week. And I thought what I would do is just bring you up to date um, with what's going on, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And really, I, I think one of the things about social media, things like CTSS or Facebook, is the ability to really get information to you. And of course, the information is not pretty. This is from last night about midnight. And obviously, these numbers keep going up. And hopefully, we're going to flatten the curve. But you know, the numbers keep going up. The only good number is the number on the right, the green number, which is the total recovered. But um, hopefully, we're going to win this battle. I, I'm sure we will. I first want to say before I give this talk, a job well done, and this is just a limited uh, number of people I'm going to comment on. I want to congratulate radiology and AJR and JACR and the European Journal of Radiology and other journals for A, the speed of which they're doing peer review to get the critical information out to us. It's amazing, and particularly Dave Blumkit Radiology has been able to get the most amazing articles from China and elsewhere that I think are very critical for all of us in the front lines trying to manage and read these studies correctly. So real kudos to them. It's amazing. I did this this morning. How many, if you type in COVID-19 on PubMed, there's something like uh, 1,500 different articles. And if you did this two months ago, it would be like two articles. So you can see the amount of information is constantly changing. Uh, resources, there are too many for me to name, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but I would say RSNA through radiology and uh, th cardiothoracic, their extra journal, uh, has really done a great job. They list all the resources. It's tremendous, tremendous connectivity. So uh, it's a great place to go. AJR has done a great job as well, and but uh, RSNA has the best stuff and the connectivity to to CDC and WHO, it's kind of everything in one place. So I think, and it can continually changes. So I think uh, to give credit to them for a wonderful, wonderful job. And also other things, again, I'll just pick one and I'll just pick Elsevier. I have no conflict of interest with Elsevier, but I think it's, um, it's really, they've done a great job with the clinical toolkit uh, here's just an example about some of the definitions. It goes on and on. So some of the publishers at Elsevier is one. Again, I have no conflict of interest, though I do like when they accept my articles at some of their, their journals, but have done a really good job. So there's tons of material out there. And again, you want to get the right material. And then the other day, you may have noticed that we posted from uh, Scott Simpson and Harold Lidd and Anna Kolansky and Galperin and Barbaroso. I hope I pronounced the name correctly this excellent confidence level reporting, which I'll show you a little bit about in this talk today, uh, that was really terrific. And you can see we posted it. They were kind enough to let us post it. And it reached 272,000 people on CTS Us in two days, 41,000 engagements, which is just really impressive. So the information can get out there very, very quickly. 1,500 shares, so people were sharing the information. Let me just go through a couple articles, and that's what I was going to do today. Um, there are a lot of articles, and there's more and more articles every moment, but there's several that I think are very good. This was an article, and again, it's going to show you how things change. This was like a, a few weeks ago, which is like a lifetime ago, in, a, in radiology, looking at 21 symptomatic patients from China with COVID-19, and you can see at that point it was even called something else. And here's just some of the results. 21 patients, typical CT findings included bilateral parenchymal ground glass and consolidative opacities, sometimes with a rounded morphology and peripheral lung distribution. 
Notably, cavitation, nodules, and effusions, as well as lymphadenopathy were absent. So again, as you read cases, what you see is one thing. Remember, there's things that look very similar on chest CT, of course, but the fact there are no effusions or lymphadenopathy indeed can be very, very helpful. In this article by Chung, uh, they again, you can see how the name has changed very quickly, at least what we typically will call it, makes the point it's a family of viruses that cause diseases range from the common cold to SARS to MERS. Um, again, one of the things, um, and this was a small number of patients, but it was impressive at that moment, 71% had involvement of more than two lobes, 57% had ground glass opacities, which is going to be one of the critical findings, rounded opacities, peripheral distribution, and four had crazy paving. And again, what was not there? Cavitation, nodules, effusions, and lymphadenopathy. And this article also makes the point that we all know is a negative chest CT does not mean you don't have the disease. Typically, from the time you contract the disease till you might have chest findings might be five days. And this article also talks about how the similarity between uh, SARS and MERS potentially, surely in terms of some of the CT findings, as well as some of the pathology involved, um, makes the point again, lung involvement with the peripheral predominance was also seen in SARS and MERS. Likewise, previous coronavirus pneumonias also had a crazy paving pattern. So again, you could see how things begin to look the same, both from a path perspective and a uh, histologic perspective and a radiologic perspective. Again, there is value in recognizing that the CT appearance of uh, COVID-19 shares some similarities with other diseases that cause viral pneumonia. As new cases are identified, other findings will indeed become to be seen. And from that article, you see some of the very nice classic patterns. And many of you have seen these. There's been a number of different articles, radiology, AJR, the NIH, that you can look at, that you can see the crazy paving. You get used to the appearance. Very, very important. Another article, this was an article of 63 patients, and I tried to jump through journals. This was European radiology, talked about 63 patients in Wuhan, and some of their key points. And again, you can see the articles tend to say very similar things. High-res CT is critical for early detection and severity and follow-up. Radiologists need to be aware of the various findings, but also the temporal changes. So here, in this article, median number of lobes was more than three. So again, solitary is not common, two or three from those two articles. 30% had one lobe, five, two, and you can see some of the numbers. 28 patients of 44% had five affected lobes. Patchy ground glass opacities, GGOs, you're gonna hear that a lot. Patchy consolidation, fibrous stripes, 54, or 85% patients progressed, including single GGOs increasing in size. And so one of the things to recognize when you look at the pattern is the fact that things change over time. And so this becomes very important. Um, in the same article by Pan, talking about the importance of chest CT as a screening tool. Now, again, there's been a lot of debate Originally, people were saying you should use CT as a screening tool rather than lab studies. I think the key is the lab study, and that's what most of the articles, and I'll show you some of that data in a few moments, what people do say, and then, of course, the imaging does help confirm the diagnosis, or if there's a high clinical suspicion, it can be done in a few seconds, while the lab studies are taking four to 12 hours or longer in select patients. This article also makes the point that disease progresses. So in many patients, uh, what looks like relatively mild disease today, within a couple disease, within a couple days rather, things will change. And uh, just, just some examples, um, here's a, a set of various lesions in different patients, just to give you a feel of how things look. Again, the articles are very consistent. And here's just, um, just some more of those images uh, with follow-up, just showing you how things indeed change. So that becomes very important to recognize. 
There was an article, I think this was published literally today, high risk CT of COVID-19 infections in patients of different ages. And you know, one of the things we all are aware of that the older population is having a more difficult time. Maybe it's response, the IL-6 response. There could be a lot of reasons, the comorbidities, but in this article, they make the point, some of the highlights, GGO with crazy paving of interlobular septi were common. Fewer lesions were identified in younger patients. Distribution of lesions did show age-related differences. So we know that the older patients, and you can see when they divided things up based on under 18, 18 to 44, 45 to 59, and over 60, you can see that these, the patients who were older had more severe disease and more extensive involvement, which may explain in part why they do poorly. And the progression articles have shown in older patients is often far more uh, concerning than in younger patients. In this article, small patch of ground glass opacities and consolidation were the main uh, HRCT findings in 98 patients. Patients under 45 to 59 and over 60 had more bilateral lung, lung lobe, and lung field involvement and greater lesion number than patients under 18. So not only did it seem that way, from, particularly from the initial data from China, where fortunately the younger patients were not involved in like the flu of 1918, but the senior patients were more involved. And so we need to be very careful, particularly for those patients particularly with those with high risk. And in the study also, the lesions of the patients were mainly located in the lower lobe on the right side. It also felt that the lesions were mostly distributed in the periphery of the lung, and maybe because the virus affects the terminal bronchioles. So again, when you're reading lower lung, not upper, peripheral, not central, that can be very helpful in this article by Chen, and in the same article, they make the point that um, ground glass opacities with crazy paving or interlobus septal thickening was the most common sign, okay? Lesions, mostly 1 to 3 cm, patchy or nodular opacity. So again, that can be very helpful. And again, just to summarize, less in younger patients, which may explain why the mortality, it seems in younger patients is something like 0.2%. Older patients, depending on the way you look, it's three to four percent or a bit higher. So again, something important to look at. Um, and the, concluding our study showed that middle-aged and older patients had more severe lung involvement and lobe involvement at the same time, the lesions were accompanied more often by air bronchograms. Very unusual for diseases to behave like this, but that indeed is the case. And they went through a lot of different potential comments, and I won't go through this in the interest of time. One of the things we will do when we finish this talk is we will post everything online. So on this Facebook Live, if you come back in 15 minutes after the talk, we're gonna have this presentation, so you'll be able to look at it. And again, some of the comments by Chen, uh, they have some good examples in this article of cases. Also, again, the importance when they looked at time, GGOs in the early stage increased crazy paving in progressive, consolidation in the peak stage, and gradient resolution of consolidation over 14 days. Very, very important. Now, I just also, as I mentioned, there's 1,500 plus articles. I did not read all those articles, but two things I read that were published in the last day or so that I thought were valuable. This is from the Korean Journal of Radiology based on their own experience. Three points, CT is a useful tool for surveillance of pneumonic lesions and is likely to detect early or mild lesions in the virus life cycle. Therefore, CT plays an important role in detecting or monitoring patients with suspected COVID-19. Second, not all patients, and very important, other articles have said this as well, but to emphasize, not all patients with COVID-19 have abnormal CT features. That becomes very important because if you're using CT, to say you have disease or you don't, you'll be wrong early, so you need to be very, very careful. Real-time reverse transcriptinase polymerase chain reaction amplification of the viral DNA is still considered the gold standard. CT is helpful. And the third thing they mention is fever and cough have been the most frequent initial symptoms 
and radiologists should pay attention to these symptoms. Lastly, the history of exposure to other patients with COVID or the epidemic area is critical to know. And so something we always know in radiology, you need to correlate clinically, okay? Work with your colleagues. That indeed becomes something we always do. And another article, this was just published again yesterday. This is from the Journal of Infection. Again, I think this group is out of China. Patients with COVID pneumonia had a typical transition from early stage to advanced stage and then to resolution. They talk a bunch about fibrosis. Patients with fibrosis and follow-up CT were older with longer length of stay and higher rate of ICU admission. So I think one of the things we are gonna see as patients recover, which hopefully most of our patients do, you are gonna see chronic long-term changes in the lung and how much of that we'll see. Now, one thing you must know, of course, is that AI is going after COVID-19. AI will be critical in this and future infections for different agents, both in trying to detect them early, which was able to do. They picked up the first batches of patients in China. I forgot the name of the program, but also to develop the drugs and speed drug development and speed and understanding of the virus. And then also AI is being used to basically look and try to read the studies and determine, and perhaps this can be very valuable in speeding up the process, particularly in areas where the imaging uh, and the number of people able to read it become limited. Uh, this makes, this article just published in radiology makes the point, a deep learning algorithm. Now this article is very good, but it does make the point that there is overlap in chest CT findings of all viral pneumonias with other diseases. Now, Okay, so they were very good at picking up the presence of viral pneumonia or pneumonia, but of course, in the right setting, it's gonna be COVID, but if you just put a thousand cases together and you mix them up, the difference between COVID and community-acquired pneumonia could be somewhat problematic, but they did a very good job. And you will see AI, and there've been several articles. This article by Lynn is a good article, uh, but I think at the end of the day, we need to be certain that uh, we are, um, we, we're aware of that, and I think most of us are. Now, this was posted on CTSS the other day, and I made a comment about that. This was some excellent work done from University of Pennsylvania, and real kudos for them being willing to share with everybody. Now, that article and other things led to this, uh, Dave Blumke announced this yesterday. This was published online in Radiology just last night, a consensus statement. You need to read this article. Okay, you need to read the article, but let me just touch on a few points. This article, the aim was to provide guidance to radiologists in reporting CT findings with COVID-19. Also, the importance of knowing what's an incidental finding versus what's COVID-19. The goal of the expert consensus is to help radiologists recognize the findings of COVID-19 and aid their communication with other healthcare providers so again, how can we be helpful? So some of the things this article talks about are the various appearances, GGO, crazy paving, uh, perihylar pattern was not reported, that peripheral pattern. Uh, again, what's not seen, bronchial wall thickening, mucoid impaction, and tree and bud nodules are not seen. Lymphadenopathy and pleural effusions are rarely seen. So again, this has certain differences from other things. Now, the frequency of imaging findings also depends on when patients were imaged. So the earlier someone's image, you may have a negative study. A slight majority of patients had a negative CT during the first two days after a symptom onset. So again, maybe after four or five days, that's when you're gonna see things peaking at that six to 13. Very important, therefore a negative CT should not be used to exclude the possibility of COVID-19. That is very, very important because as people were pushing, as we didn't have the lab test, CT became more and more important, but you need to know the limitations, okay? Chest findings, chest CT findings can precede positivity on the RT-PCR. Again, um, if someone's suspicious and we scan them, we usually can make the right diagnosis. Reported sensitivity is the specificity of CT for COVID very widely, likely due to the retrospective nature of the currently published studies. But again, the positive and negative predictive values are estimated at 92% and 42%.
in a population with a high pretest probability. So again, we have to understand that the articles are being published to help everyone. Maybe they don't have the rigor of many of the articles that are typically published because we don't have three months to wait to collect data and then analyze it. So again, you need to take things with a little bit of grain of salt, but again, things are indeed very helpful. Now, what this article did was build on that you have pen article and other people's work to come up with four categories. This is important to make life easy so that everyone's reporting things the same and our clinicians understand what we're doing. Typical features are those that are reported in the literature to be frequently and more specifically seen with COVID-19 pneumonia. So that's the typical findings, okay? There's a differential for them, but that's the typical findings. And here they are, just a nice example. Um, here, again, when we scan the patients, high-res CT, non-contrast, thin sections, again, GGOs in this case, crazy paving, read the article, you'll see it. And here's just some more examples. Again, you see that here. And here's just some more examples, kind of that uh, nodular pattern. So these are typical CT features for COVID-19. Then we talk about indeterminate features, those which have been reported but are not specific enough to arise at a relatively confident radiologic diagnosis. So an example would be a diffuse GGO without a clear distribution because it occurs in many other things. So you want to be very, very careful at that. And here's just a couple examples of indeterminate CT imaging features. So again, so now we have typical, we have indeterminate. We then have what's called atypical, are those reported to be uncommon and not occurring in COVID? which include the, uh, which are typical for bacterial pneumonia, segmental consolidation, ca necrotizing cavitation, tree and bud opacities are some of those examples. And here's just, a, again, just an example of an atypical feature for COVID-19. And here's just two more examples. So again, break things up, negative for pneumonia. And of course, the fourth category would be negative. The study's negative, there's nothing there. Again, as we said, particularly early on, a negative study does not exclude COVID-19. Very, very important. The lab test, the RT-PCR, is more sensitive early. So, and again, the authors were very good. Scott Simpson's the lead author, Brian, not Howard Litz, the last author. Imaging appearances in the standardized reporting language are based on available literature at the time of writing in March 2020, which means things can change. As radiologists experience with COVID-19 increases, our categorization of these findings as typical, indeterminate, or atypical may evolve. The only thing that's not gonna evolve is normal. So again, these four categories, I think it's very helpful. I think if you think about this, it'll be easier for you to report. It'll be easier for your clinicians to understand. And here's just a little chart, and perhaps copy the chart, email it to your referring docs, and tell them, hey, this is what we're doing, this is how we're reporting things. Again, so things are really uh, well done. And you can see it here. So again, uh, I took some liberty of copying and just crediting Scott Simpson and Radiology for publishing this in press. Go read it yourself. And in saying that, um, you know, I, I think all of us, these are very trying times for everybody. And you can see from this picture that technologists, radiology nursing and radiologists, and obviously all our clinicians in medicine, the ER, everybody is involved. But I think it's very important. It's really an uphill battle. It's gonna take a while. It's not gonna be Easter time. It would be great if it's Easter time. That'd be great. You know, I'm looking Memorial Day, I'm looking July 4th to get back to a little more normalcy. So it's gonna be tough for everybody. I think everyone stay safe. Uh, there's anything we could do at CTSS, provide any specific information, help out uh, with anything, read films even. Well, whatever you need, let us know. And with that, hopefully this is helpful. And as I mentioned, this PowerPoint presentation will go live in a few minutes. So with that, I wanna thank Lily Kaufman. Lily, help me get this together. So we're, we're both remote from each other. So uh, usually she would just do it and I would just show up and look good but I had to look good. <laughs> we went through this for about an hour this morning getting it right. So with that, I'll thank everybody. Keep safe, and we'll see you uh, next week, if not sooner.
Bye-bye.